Bitcoin mining is the secret energy resource that nobody realizes is the most important thing. It's really hard to believe for me that there would be anything that could seriously damage this network or get in the way of it achieving its ultimate purpose. That's the world-changing, mind-bending, philosophy-questioning asset that you should be studying. Bitcoin is going to lower the cost of energy for all. It's really an example of, of anti-fragility and invincibility. It's one of our first kind of invincible assets to ever grace the world. Bitcoin mining is its own version of alcohol. Alchemy. Through this repeatable process of generating entropy, you actually create the most impressive money in the world. You turn raw energy into Bitcoin. It's a profound evolution for human freedom and prosperity. Bitcoin mining is going to reshape our energy landscape. Bitcoin mining is the secret energy resource that nobody realizes is the most important thing that is going on in our world today. I, I love that so much. I, I, I really want to just get started right away with that. Um, first of all, like, like, why are you so, before we get into that topic, why are you so passionate about Bitcoin mining? Uh, and why did you pick Bitcoin mining out of that, uh, that topic pool that is so broad in Bitcoin? <laughs> Sure. So I was first exposed to Bitcoin in 2015, uh, one of the, my first few years in college. I, at the time, you know, was a shit coiner as well. So I had an interest in Ethereum and, and anything else that was coming out at the time. I didn't fully appreciate, you know, how impactful Bitcoin itself was um, in the, the kind of sea of noise. And I tried to get into mining almost immediately. So within, you know, a few months of buying my first coins, which sadly I, you know, let go of far too quickly. But within a few months of getting my first coins, tried to get into a, a mining startup that was in Sweden. And it was this company that offered, you know, I think at the time it was an S3 that you got uh, an S3 that was hosted in Sweden on hydropower. And I got payouts for a couple months. And then that company, you know, went belly up or the, the owners, you know, decided to abscond with whatever funds they had, and I stopped getting payouts. So that was my first kind of uh, exposure to Bitcoin mining. And then years later, uh, 2021 kind of reinvigorated my, my study of Bitcoin. Uh, at that time, I found The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth and The Sovereign Individual. And between those two books, you know, just had my interest in Bitcoin very much reinvigorated. And uh, my major in college was, was very complementary to building and operating data centers. So I already had some exposure to what it took to run something like a Bitcoin mining farm. And I got into Bitcoin mining much more seriously at that point. I put a significant portion of my net worth into some machines that I tried to host in the southeastern United States. And I had an awful experience, like one of the worst years of my life because I just picked the wrong host, the wrong equipment um, and put you know far too much that that was not comfortable at all to, to have a loss that year. And so I was getting into it thinking this is a great source of passive income. This is a great way for me to, you know, get cash flow. At the time, my, my wealth building vehicle was real estate. So I was a full-time real estate investor and just had this really awful experience that I thought nobody in the world should have to go through this if they're trying to get into Bitcoin mining. And I realized that my story was not unique, that plenty of people have had awful experiences putting some funds into Bitcoin mining and this is why so many people say, you know, just buy Bitcoin, don't get into mining. There's no, there's no real reason to get into it. It's not necessarily more profitable. And I didn't want to believe that. I didn't want that to be my story. I didn't want that to be the story for people. And so I took that experience, decided to take what I had left and build a co-location facility here in Oregon. It took about 12 months to get it off the ground. Um, it was not an easy journey. We had roadblocks along the way. But I'm happy to say that, you know, we got that facility up and running. We're currently hosting uh, about 500 units of other people's machines. And, uh, you know, we're able to deliver a much more positive and pleasant experience for the people that, that host with us than the experience that got me into mining. So in a sense, it was a, a story of I never wanted anybody to have my experience again. And I knew that we could offer something better than what was currently on the market in mining. Do you think uh, uh, Bitcoin mining is something for the average pleb to, to get into? Or is it only if you have advantage in building those facilities or advantaging uh, in, in the cost of, of energy? So 
My opinion would be it's it's useful for anybody to learn about. It's useful for anybody to get into, even if it's just at a small size. Even people that host their machines with us, you know, my my advice is always if you don't have any Bitcoin already stacked, you should start there. You should get a, a reasonably sized portfolio of just the coin because that's really the asset, right? That's the world changing, mind bending, you know, philosophy questioning asset that you should be studying. And mining is just a way to get a better understanding of it. So anytime people get into mining, I always caveat it with, you know, at minimum, this is really just a learning tool so that you can have a better understanding of the asset you own. And then when it comes to being profitable or being more profitable than owning the coin, that's when I would say, you know, context matters, what your energy sources matters, what kind of machines you're running matters. Then you're introducing a lot more variables to people that they should consider in their own individual circumstance, which is something that we help people do. But I, I always start with own Bitcoin, understand Bitcoin, then get into mining so that you can study even deeper. For learning about Bitcoin mining, um, how far would you say we have to go? Like, is a solo miner, those small nerd miners, <laughs> enough to learn about mining, or uh, should we actually like? buy used S9 and, and plug it in the home with a solar panel or something like that? I think it's it's like anything in life, right? You get what you put in. So if if all that you can do is buy a bit X and you know mine with 500 giga hash out of your USB outlet, you're still getting benefit from that, right? And not everybody wants to spend five or six thousand dollars on the newest unit from Bitmain or What's Miner or Oridine. And so I think anything that you can do to further your learning of what's actually going on at the protocol level, you know, what's actually happening when you mine a block, that anything is going to be beneficial. And I'm pretty convinced that after you get your first giga hash online, that you're going to want to upscale that. You're going to want to figure out how you can reuse your waste heat. You're going to want to figure out, oh, if I have a spa, it might be really interesting to put in a, a dual loop immersion cooler so that I can, you know, heat my spa in the winter for free. I think it's just a, it's a rabbit hole that you fall down as quickly and as deeply as you are willing to. Really interesting. Um, maybe let's get to this topic now with uh, lowering the cost of energy. You said uh, Bitcoin will lower the cost of energy for, for us all. Uh, it makes it more efficient. How do you mean that? Like, uh, why is that? So in our world today, we have many different demands for energy. So you see the EV revolution, you see the electrification of things like home heating and cooling, um, data centers coming online. AI is a very hot topic right now of, of you know, a major power user and a major demand for new power resources. And that's all going to continue to happen. We're going to demand more and more energy as time goes on. And the future versions of us will use far more energy and it be a far cleaner use of energy than we do today. And that's a good thing. But in the context of growing our need for uh, energy to be supplied, that means that we have to grow the availability of energy that we can create. Now in the Pacific Northwest specifically, and many other regions, there are also decarbonizing initiatives. So you're facing all of these calls to you know, remove thermal generation, remove gas-fired peaker plants, uh, and really encouraging the use of things like wind and solar and these other kind of intermittent renewables that even though they are very positive, they create a lot of energy, they don't necessarily create reliable energy. So in the absence of something like batteries or an interruptible load, you have to have, you have, to have something to counterbalance having an intermittent generation source. And so the reason that I say Bitcoin is going to lower the cost of energy for all is because if you're going to encourage intermittent load or excuse me, intermittent energy generation, that means you also need intermittent load. So you need an intermittent demand source. And Bitcoin mining is one of the few things that we can stand up on a grid that demands a huge amount of energy, but that you can also turn off when you need to. So if you've uh, seen in Texas, there's frequent curtailments during the summer. The network hash rate loves to come uh, come down a bit during these hot summer months. And part of that is economic curtailment uh, that has to do with 
uh, a lack of availability of energy or you know an increase in the price of energy at those times. So Bitcoin miners, as the most price sensitive users, they turn off and essentially deliver that energy back to the grid. So if you're thinking about how to design a grid system, you've got all your generation resources and then you also have demand resources. And if you have generation that does not quite come up to what you need for either a you know, midsummer peak or midwinter peak here in the Pacific Northwest, that means that you've got to have something that's, that's going to give that energy back. And many people talk about batteries. Batteries are a, a great solution for, for grid management and giving energy back to the grid in times of peak demands. Uh, but it, at the current time, they're either very expensive or many of them are highly inefficient. So it pays to be able to have resources in your service territory that can turn off. And even though you're not delivering any new energy to the grid, because you are able to turn off your demand for that energy, it has the same net benefit. So rather than us going out and building, you know, crazy amounts of, of expensive peaker plants that may get used for a few hundred hours a year, instead, you just have a user who's able to cut off their use at specific times that avoid uh, major, major price spikes. And to illustrate this with numbers, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, your average your average cost of procuring energy is going to be somewhere between sixty and ninety dollars per megawatt hour. If you want to turn on a thermal generation peaker plant for just a few hundred hours a year, that can go up to fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars per megawatt hour. So, if you are going to pay a Bitcoin miner, for example, to perform demand response rather than turn on a peaker plant, that might cost you two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars per megawatt hour in equivalent energy savings. Net net, the cost of or the cost benefit of having a demand response resource in your grid versus uh, turning on a peaker plant might save you 96, 97 percent of the energy costs that you would incur for those couple hundred hours of emergency circumstances. It's really interesting when when we look at Bitcoin mining. There's so many interesting angles we can go through, uh, but it's the the flexibility of Bitcoin mining, uh, as you mentioned, uh, that's such an amazing uh, advantage and I feel like a lot of states get it like taxes uh, but a lot of states still don't get it like they are still thinking oh no Bitcoin mining is bad it's like for the environment and all those 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 thoughts that they have in their head um, is the, the one thing uh, that I maybe to get a better grid of that uh, I had I think a month ago, a one and a half months ago, a podcast with someone that writes fiction novels that are far in the future, also related to Bitcoin. And there are parts of it that's just fiction and parts of it he actually thinks will come true. Uh, and it's just really, it was, it was a podcast that actually like expands your thinking of where Bitcoin could go. Uh, so far that he said like 99% of Earth's, uh, of, of the energy of the universe uh, that uh, uh, people will live on, like when we live also on other planets, uh, will be used um, to mine Bitcoin uh, because we will have so much energy that we will live in, in such an abundance that we will just turn on this as the best form of monetization of that energy. And with that 1% that we have left, we have more than enough energy to uh, do everything that humans uh, can do. Is is that something that you could foresee very far in the future? He also talked about uh, putting solar panels on Mercury <laughs> and stuff like that. I could definitely see that playing out, you know, you can you can phrase it as Bitcoin will lower the cost of energy for all. You could also say that Bitcoin will usher in an era of energy abundance. So that that example that you were just talking about really fits that. You know, we're living in a world where there's so much energy. We've we've been so innovative and so smart with our resources that there's there's almost nothing else that we need to use it for because we've created so much of it, and that's. That's kind of the, the the other side of that same coin, and it's not it's not such a it's not such a crazy thing. I mean, 
even in, in Texas, you mentioned, I think they are very forward thinking. And in many ways, being in the Pacific Northwest, we're just trying to model some of the success and some of the experimentation that they've already done successfully. Um, they had a story where several years ago, they were going to put on uh, an additional $10 billion of peaker plants. So they foresaw a need for additional emergency generation at certain points of the year. And Berkshire Hathaway was going to build these peaker plants so that they had additional energy on the grid for these peak times. And because of the presence of Bitcoin mining, there's about two gigawatts of, of interruptible load uh, that's characterized as Bitcoin mining on the grid. Because they were already participating in demand response programs, uh, Texas did not need to build those additional peaker plants. So they saved taxpayers, you know, collectively about $10 billion in avoided costs. And, you know, that's a form of abundance. That's a form of energy abundance is not needing to develop anything additional um, and being able to just stick with your current baseload generation is, is avoiding building that additional. So I see, you know, that's, that's one real life story where, where, uh, Bitcoin mining was able to encourage energy abundance and save people money on on energy costs. But you project that further out into the future and it's likely to impact every grid system that we have. Um, I love the the company Gridless in in Kenya. You know, they're extremely innovative with with how they bring energy abundance to these communities that, again, this, this already exists. All of, all of the energy that we need is already here in the world, and most of it's just wasted or not properly used. Um, I, think, I think Bitcoin mining, especially in those contexts, just unlocks this ability to use resources that have been uh, you know, either economically stranded uh, or there was no highest and best use for those energy resources. And now because we can introduce these interruptible loads, this, this kind of baseload consumer that always wants energy, but is also always willing to give it back, uh, really encourages this, this beautiful flourishing of humanity and, and gives us uh, energy abundance in this way that at least I never thought would be the way that it would come about, but is very interesting to watch unfold and very interesting to be a part of. Why do we keep hearing in, uh, especially in the mainstream media, um, that energy is so scarce that uh, we everything will skyrocket in price? And I mean, it will skyrocket in price if you measure it in, in a highly inflatable currency. But uh, why is that scarcity in energy this this kind of mindset in 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 uh, people who are not uh, in in energy and and why do they don't see that that we actually could go to like an energy abundant future? I think you hit it. Part of it is that we we denominate it in a highly inflationary currency. So even if the true cost of energy stays level, you're going to see your bill go up every year. And it's, it's hard to convince people of something that's different than what they see, that's different uh, than what they see on their power bill every month. But the other part of that is we have plenty of energy in the world, and it's usually the delivery of energy that, that makes it very expensive or very hard to get. So in, in at least the U.S., for example, we have a, a transmission capacity issue where there's more than enough energy to be created, but the actual network for distributing that energy is very old, is very, uh, you know, it was built for capacity that now we've, we've very quickly grown into and are about to grow out of. And so even if there's the ability to create new generation and create new cheap generation, uh, let's say, you know, a, a really, cheap and, and effective nuclear plant goes up in Texas, that doesn't help me at all in the Pacific Northwest because that energy has to travel more than a thousand miles to get up here. And not only is that unavailable in terms of transmission capacity, but most of that energy gets lost as well. So you can, a rule of thumb is for about every 500 miles of transmission, you lose 2% of the energy. So by the time energy travels from one coast of the US to another, you've lost you know, close to 10% of what you started with, which makes it less economical. One of the things that's come out recently that, that people are working on is, is superconductors that you know, minimize this energy loss. But even, even implementing that seems kind of like a, a far off vision. It may be something that, that becomes more popular in the next decade or two decades, but it's not a real and present solution. And that's, that's 
part of why I think Bitcoin mining is, is so important at this state in time is that we know that there are these resources that are going to make energy much more abundant. We talked about batteries for a minute. Batteries are going to be extremely important, but for now, they're very cost intensive. They're very inefficient. Um, they're still in their, their proving stage. And we have grids that are having issues now, and they're going to have issues you know, in the very near foreseeable future with capacity and transmission and peak availability. And it's my opinion that all of these other innovations are going to be very important, but that they're not quite ready, that they're still very early stages. And something like Bitcoin mining and interruptible load has already been working on the grid for years. Uh, I mean, demand response programs in Texas have been around um, you know, far longer than Bitcoin mining even has. Demand response is not a new idea. This is, this is not something that Bitcoin miners invented. We just happen to be really good at participating in it. So it's, it's my opinion that we have a clear and present danger with our grids becoming unreliable and extremely expensive. And that Bitcoin mining is the most near-term, most readily available resource that we can stop the price increases and stop the unreliability of our grids with technology that we have available and scalable today. Is it recommended for people who have uh, a house, who have a roof that's mostly in the sun, or what's stopping them to put like a bunch of solar panels on there, plug a, a Bitcoin miner on there, use the energy that they use uh, in the household. If they have access energy, just put it in the in the Bitcoin miner and just monetize all the access energy, uh, turn it off the Bitcoin miners if, if they have less energy, like uh, that, that would be even better than a battery, I feel like. I think that's part of it, uh, you know, or even having both in tandem, you know, the, The grid scale batteries, I think, are very expensive. But uh, if you have, have ever heard of or, you know, people with Tesla power walls, those are those are playing demand response games right now in people's homes. And you can choose to sell your power back to the grid or you could sell your own stored power to your own Bitcoin miner. Um, I think it's only going to become more common for us to have these these more like microgrids where where people at their source of consumption have some kind of generating resource. That's kind of another uh, pressure release valve for making sure that our grids remain stable is having the ability for homes and businesses to generate some of their own energy. And if they are generating their own energy, you know, in, in many cases, it's not as attractive to sell that energy back to the grid. You get uh, a far lower a far lower proportion of what you would pay for that energy when you give that energy back. You know, some, something on the order of 20 to 50 percent uh, is, is what you can expect to sell your energy back for versus what you pay for it. And so if, let's say just for example, residential rates in the Pacific Northwest are around 15 cents a kilowatt hour and I can sell that energy back for five or six cents a kilowatt hour. Well, if I have a Bitcoin miner, I would much rather, if it's one of the newer generation units, I would much rather get my, you know, 12 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour for just running my Bitcoin miner versus selling my energy back to the grid. So definitely at the individual level, I think that it's, it's very interesting to start integrating your own generation, your own storage, as well as a way to use energy economically uh, through Bitcoin mining at your home. That's also a way that you can keep it Uh, non-KYC, self-sovereign, you know, all the things that Bitcoiners love is if you're doing it on your own network in your own home and it's not tied to a hosting facility like ours or many of the others in the world, there's there's almost nothing that anybody can do to stop you from using that and from from generating your own sound money. And it's the, the best non-KYC because it comes literally from nobody. Mm -hmm. Like even, even if you exchange with someone, Uh, on the on the street and you make like this someone knows that the bitcoin are now with you uh so like even if you have really strictly non-kyc bitcoin um they are not completely non-kyc <laughs> uh they have to have someone the someone maybe knows you it's still better to have than a full kyc exchange or something like that completely bitcoin mining uh, and then get those bitcoin as non-kyc in your uh, in your wallet and have it as a completely separate stack to the other stack and, and never connecting them uh, that would be uh, i think a, a great way to to stack some non-kyc 
uh, Bitcoin with a depending on how you do it, probably with a premium, uh, depending on, on how, how you have access uh, to it. Uh, because if, if, if Bitcoin mining could be more costly than just stacking Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? It can be for sure. And that's, that's part of why I always tell people, you know, start, start with your stack, start with your Bitcoin stack before you put a meaningful portion of your net worth into mining. Um, but that said, you know, there's, there's all kinds of really cool revolutions going on in our world, Bitcoin being one of them. But I, I view the proliferation of Bitcoin mining as the availability of your own personal alchemical process. So if you think of, of alchemy as being transforming base metals into gold um, or the internal alchemical process of, of transforming base emotions into this kind of higher spiritual vibration. I think Bitcoin mining is its own version of alchemy where you're, you're able to take these raw resources. Energy comes in many forms and, and people have all sorts of different ways of gaining energy. But you take this kind of lower level disordered or not quite perfectly ordered energy source and through this repeatable process of generating entropy you actually create you know the most impressive money in the world far more impressive than turning lead into gold you turn energy raw energy into bitcoin the soundest money in the world i think it's a profound evolution for human freedom and prosperity that everybody can be in charge of this open alchemical process that they're able to participate in at will. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship setup, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. That's true. That's uh, really cool. And also uh, what I thought about right now is when we have... Uh, as we talked about a little bit before with the solar panels on the roof and having your own uh, um, uh, power plant basically at home and when you have the power wall from, from Tesla, as we talked about, will will that in the future, when we have more and more of these developments, then also like decentralize the, the Bitcoin mining further? I would say so. I would say very large corporate farms like the public companies that mega facility model, unless you have a very specialized strategy, is likely to get outcompeted by uh, gorilla miners, people that have their own energy generation. They don't have huge fixed administration costs and corporate costs. The people who have their own resource are able to mine at any cost, do not turn off their hash rate for any reason and uh, are not subject to the same kinds of constraints as large grid operated miners, I think those are our future. And I think that that only contributes to the health of the network. And you already see this in, in you know, places like Africa, where most of the miners who are mining in Africa are not mining on the grid. You know, they're, they're mining with their own generation sources, often many miles or hundreds of miles from the nearest population center. I think that that trend of co-locating Bitcoin mining with these distributed energy resources that are owned by individuals and families is only going to lead to more decentralization, more decentralization, more security, um, and a network that is that is healthier, to be honest with you. We've seen in the last year some some kind of pool centralization fears from people that that many of the blocks are being mined by some version of ant pool. Um, I think that, that as the resources being dedicated to Bitcoin mining 
spread out more effectively and become more distributed, those kinds of fears are, are able to fade into the background. We're able to, to really uh, believe that we've got a much more decentralized network that, that is much more secure from any kind of centralized attack or uh, from you know, large public companies that are on grid being co-opted by a government with malicious intent. I don't think it's a strong danger right now, but I would like it to be not even a thought Right. And I think most people who are who are Bitcoiners would agree. We even though we're not necessarily concerned for for today's problems, we want tomorrow to be uh, a very clear and open network that that doesn't rely on the cooperation of of some of these larger entities. A, a lot of people um, make that argument, though, the the pool centralization like mining i feel like is quite decentralized now like uh, america has what like 30 percent or something like that of the mining power and they are the biggest ones uh in 2021 it was a little bit of a different story where a lot of the mining power was still in china <laughs> good for us they they wanted to get rid of it they did not get rid of it but they decentralized the bitcoin mining grid um, with that action uh thank you china <laughs> i would say Uh, um, but but would the mining pools, if let's say there are only really two uh, big mining pools, uh, I mean, there are more now, but if, if there would be like, if the mining pool centralization would go in a bad direction, would that be uh, something you would worry about? So uh, once upon a time, I would have worried about it. Uh, but with protocols like Ocean, I don't know if you've, you've had any of them on to talk with you, but... Um, What, what they've been working on really brings the power of, of creating block templates back to the miners themselves. And so even if, let's say, Antpool or Antpool's derivatives control 60 to 70 percent of the hash rate, even if that is true, and even if most blocks are mined with their you know, criteria and their templates, any individual miner, so long as they are, are still contributing to the network, has the ability to mine a block with their own template. So we could go through a period where uh, it's more challenging. There's maybe more censorship or more uh, putting in of, of these kinds of, of data and transactions that, that some fundamental Bitcoiners really don't like. But the fact that any blocks, because you know it's a random process, right? When, when, you're, when you're mining, you are looking for this, this nonce, this single random number It's available to any of the, the miners on the network. And it just happens that these large pools are going to find it more often. But even if it's one out of 10 times or one out of 30 times, you're still going to get transactions through. So I could see I could see a regime of suppression, but I don't think you could get to all out stopping of the free movement of data and trade over the network. I think that it would be at worst you know, slowing down the ability for people to get their transactions through, uh, but not able to, to all out stop it or all out censor. For me, uh, a big part of my confidence in Bitcoin actually comes from 2017 from the block size wars. Mm -hmm. uh, when you really studied that, you're like, oh, the, the decentralization of the nodes, the decentralizations of the actual use of Bitcoin um, is really important uh, to that whole story. And even if uh, seemingly the whole industry is for larger blocks and, and uh, all, a lot of Bitcoin miners are even for that, um, even then resilience of the network is really strong and it just grows on. Like we had now a point where I put the risk on Bitcoin so extremely low mm -hmm. that the risk reward is just like such a beautiful thing right now. I totally agree with you. I, when I first got into, you know, was first studying it around 2015, between 2015 and 2017, let's say, I still thought that there were plenty of ways for it to be damaged or co-opted or, you know, in some way hampered from achieving its ultimate purpose. I, at this point in, in time, I find it really hard to believe that there's almost anything. And I, you know, I knock on wood as I say this, because I, I don't want there to be anything, but It, it's really hard to believe for me that there would be anything that could seriously damage this network or get in the way of it achieving its ultimate purpose. In fact, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, is there anything that you worry about at this point other than just human action? There's always like 
we know all the attack factors of Bitcoin. Like uh, we, we we talked about so many, and uh, I, I probably covered all of them already in the podcast. I'm at episode 198, so I'm, I'm soon with 200 episodes out. Uh, so we covered a lot. Um, the only thing that's possible, and I choose not to live my life uh, worrying about those, but there's always a black swan event, like something that we cannot foresee. And a black swan event, by definition, is something that we cannot foresee. Uh, so yes, of course, if you're like, oh, I want to diversify my portfolio also in gold, also in real estate, also in stocks, because there could be a black swan event. First of all, like it's really hard to think of one. <laughs> uh, and, and second of all, why would you um, put your whole life savings uh, in 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 other assets that are not as great as the best form of money ever, uh, just because there is like a zero point zero zero one percent chance that there might be something bad happening. And I think if such a black swan event actually happens, um, the possibilities that we can actually rely on anything in finances and computers and internet are probably pretty low because this had to be. Uh, like as long as we have the internet and as long as we have a free flow of of communication in some regard, I, it's really hard for me to imagine any uh, uh, thing that could break Bitcoin. There are attack vectors, but all of those attack vectors, when you go through them, you're like, oh, this is not, <laughs> this is almost impossible and very unrealistic. Yeah, of course, like if if, <laughs> if you... If you control all of the sudden, is, there is like uh, when all of the sudden alien creatures uh, come to Earth and they are so more, uh, so sophisticated, uh, way more sophisticated than than we are, uh, they can force their money onto us. Yeah, that that would destroy Bitcoin, <laughs> but <laughs> that would destroy all forms of money that we have. Uh, so of course, I can think of things uh, that destroy Bitcoin. But how likely are those actually? And do you really want to uh, go on? Because like it, it's like you clean the whole house and, and then there's like one small crumb laying under the table and then you're like, oh shit, <laughs> the, the whole house is dirty. No, it's like the house is clean. It, it's, it's a nice house. That's just a crumb. Like <laughs> leave it there. Like <laughs> you will not see it if you don't watch it. So uh, there's, there's no perfect, there is no hundred percent security. There's no hundred percent of anything. Uh, but Bitcoin is the closest thing to that. I feel like. Right. I see a lot. Like, I don't, I don't think there's anything on the chain itself that, that could lead to a catastrophic failure. Let's call it, um, any, any attack vectors that I see at this point that have any shot really are. They're, they're off chain. They have more to do with price suppression, you know, things like the ETFs and other kind of synthetic Bitcoin derivatives that may or may not be real coin. You know, they they can, for a time at least, co-opt the num number go up kind of benefit of Bitcoin. But I don't see I don't see anything really long term breaking the network, let's say. And you you even mentioned stocks, gold, real estate, like part of my personal transition from those assets and having those in my portfolio was realizing that all of the black swans that could impact those markets were far more likely. They were built in structurally. Um, you know, it was a, a very interesting day when it was first told to me that, hey, did you realize that most of the value of the market cap of the world's real estate is the debt that backs that real estate? You know, realizing that it, it takes one systemic event for 80% of, of the value of that asset to just evaporate overnight because it's backed by this imaginary, uh, you know, imaginary instrument that doesn't actually have any kind of value other than what you can, what you can say you owe to someone else. Um, and same with many of these others, like, like gold, even the, the issue with the ETFs for Bitcoin, like that's been a known issue for gold for years. I, I grew up in a family that, had pretty strong opinions on gold, um, own gold. And it, it took me, you know, many years of, of owning gold to realize that the price could very easily be manipulated by 
all kinds of different market mechanisms. And in some sense, you know, getting to to see the flaws, the cracks in the theses with all these different assets was even more of a selling point to to get into this thing that one, you know, only a handful of us in the world have really studied for more than a few hundred hours. Um, and two, it doesn't seem to have any of the vulnerabilities that these other asset classes do in the sense that it really is its own self-contained universe. It is the cockroach of all investment assets and short of, you know, all out nuclear war, uh, there's, there's almost nothing that can take it down. And even in your case, you know, the internet going out, that's not even a threat vector as long as you've got short band radio and you can communicate over radio signals. Like it's, it's really, um, it's really an example of, of anti-fragility and I would say almost invincibility. It's, it's one of our first kind of invincible assets to ever grace the world. And for that reason, it's, it's very interesting to study because almost nothing else, maybe nothing else, has that kind of quality baked into it. You raised right in the beginning when you started uh, a really interesting point. A lot of people um, confuse volatility and maybe even price manipulation with actual risks to Bitcoin. Because yes, uh, BlackRock could uh, issue paper Bitcoin uh, more than they actually have. FTX did that. <laughs> they had like two Bitcoin on their balance sheet and a lot more in their accounts, uh, actually. So this is something that absolutely can happen, that probably will happen in the future. <laughs> if you have your Bitcoin on an exchange where it's just a number, um, it's very likely uh, that... There might be like, <laughs> I have an, an amazing example. The last time I heard on the podcast, if you go to a bar, uh, and in the bar, you usually have to give your jacket off uh, to get in because you cannot have to check it inside of the bar. Uh, and, uh, you give them your jacket. You usually give them like one euro, two euros, and then you get a token. You have a token <laughs> now, yeah. but this token means nothing he can sell this jacket in the meantime he can rent it out in the meantime he can lay on it he can use it as a blanket he can do whatever he wants with that blanket and you have just have a token and he says like oh your token number is not even in my list did you do your to did you <laughs> issue your token yourself like <laughs> good luck <laughs> proving that you actually took the look the, the jacket there like you have no proof and the, the same thing is if you have Bitcoin, not yourself. Like if you don't have your uh, the the keys yourself, then we come to the point where, as you as you mentioned, yes, we can have uh, price manipulations with uh, F, F, uh, with uh, players like centralized exchanges or even yeah Coinbase like Bitcoin ETFs with BlackRock and stuff like that. Um, but those will only work in the short to medium term. At some mm -hmm. point, those scams come to light uh, and uh, you still have your Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, Bitcoin is worth way more because uh, they actually have to buy some or they, they, they crash down. Like no matter what happens, that the truth will come to light. And that's, th that's not really a risk. That's, I think, just short term um price manipulation, which is a short-term risk when you, your purchasing power is, is manipulated, but it's still a Bitcoin. Like you still have it, like nothing changes in the under fundamental value of it. A hundred percent. And that, you know, that goes back into why get into mining is if you, if you believe in this future where this is something that everybody demands and everybody wants to get their hands on real Bitcoin, and there's all these vehicles for you to get something that may or may not be Bitcoin, one of the few ways that you can guarantee your access to this type of money is being able to generate it yourself by having an energy resource and having an ASIC and actually mining your own blocks. It's, it's one of the few ways to guarantee that you've got sovereign access, right? This is part of, part of my reading the sovereign individual is realizing, okay, if I'm truly going to be a sovereign individual, I cannot rely on Coinbase or Kraken or any of these exchanges to have Bitcoin for me to buy in the future. And even if they do, 
you know, they, they it may come with strings attached. You never know what, what they're going to, to do. They may force you to hold it in a custody account at some point in the future. There may be regulation that, that keeps you from, from holding on to your own Bitcoin. And part of the thesis for me getting into mining was, well, you know, since 2020, the balance on exchanges has decreased. If you look at the, the trend line in 2020, we went from exchanges accumulating Bitcoin and getting up to about 4 million Bitcoin across all exchanges. Since then, downward slope goes from 4 million Bitcoin on exchanges in, in about 2020 to now, I think it's somewhere around two, maybe two and a half um, and getting lower every day because the ETFs are demanding so much. So if, if we project that further out into the future, nobody wants to sell their coin. How else are you going to get it unless you can get it directly from the network? And that was, that was my personal journey was making sure that, that I and anybody who, who I care about has their own sovereign access to being able to make their own Bitcoin and not depend on a, a third party or a regulated exchange to be able to get it for them. Yeah, that's a... Uh... That's a major thing, actually. That's really, really cool. One thing that I always try to to keep in my podcast, because it's also a Bitcoin-only focused podcast, and, and you also said you, you tried it a little bit of altcoins, what made you switch to the Bitcoin only? Like, what's what? If if there's one thing, what made you realize, oh, it, it's Bitcoin, not not the other things? Yeah, it, it plays into mining as well. Uh, Ethereum's switch to proof of stake was like the nail in the coffin for me. Um, now it was it was many other things too. I mean, one thing is the the mindset around Bitcoin. You know, anybody who's getting into altcoins or or these kind of newer projects, they're usually looking for a moonshot to you know get a lot of a lot of fiat money very quickly. You know, do some kind of crazy multiple on whatever they put into it. And so it's very much a mindset of risk taking and speculation and uh, just it, even all out gambling, you know. And at the time that that Ethereum was switching to proof of stake, I was going through my own kind of mindset shift, right, where there was a, a younger version of me who, who wanted nothing but to speculate and do a thousand X and and make a lot of money very quickly and go retire to an island. And it. It's very multifaceted, but the whole attitude around showing proof of work and showing up and, and doing the important basic things every day and not getting distracted, staying focused, um, staying true to fundamentals and, and not getting distracted by shiny object syndrome. It was it was both a personal shift and also a protocol shift that kind of coincided at the same point. This this uh, I guess it was fall of 2021 um, when when all this was going on. And so that that shift to proof of stake was was the nail in the coffin that showed me, OK, this network does not reward the people that put honest work into it. It rewards the people who already have a large stack and it's vulnerable to being co-opted by the largest holders, whereas Bitcoin has shown itself to be through its entire history, honorable truthful to its original uh you know original protocol layout truthful to the rules that it laid out and to the philosophy of what it was creating and you know it's it's so deep and it's so multifaceted but i would say that that, that was the the main point was realizing what the network was rewarding and what kind of network would actually build me into a better person so it, it gets kind of philosophical it gets to the who do you want to be and who do you want to show up as? And, you know, since 2021 or so, I've, I've been very dedicated to showing up as the man who's willing to put in the work and not shy away from a hard task that's worthwhile rather than going for the easy brain sugar dopamine of hitting something big really quickly. That's, I think, uh, a general rule in life that people can uh, adopt. Uh, go for the hard route to have an easier life <laughs> in, exactly. in the long run. That's a, that's a major, major learning that I feel like some learn too late or never. Um, you, you do a lot of, uh, Bitcoin mining, you do, uh, other things in Bitcoin. Can you give us like a little bit of an overview of what you do in Bitcoin? Uh, you, you work entirely just in Bitcoin, right? Like you're focused like only in Bitcoin right now? Correct. We we don't allow any shitcoin miners in our facilities. So we're 100% Bitcoin only company. 
Um, our main service offerings are equipment sales and hosting. So if someone's trying to get into Bitcoin mining, we're happy to supply you a machine and put it in one of our facilities. And I would say that that is the bare bones, like if I were going to do one thing well, that would be what we do just because that was my own personal experience of having such an awful time with getting the wrong equipment, getting the wrong partner, putting it in the wrong place uh, that led to so much pain. And so if we can do that right for people, that that's very important. Also with that, I think that Bitcoin mining is, is a beautiful view into engineering and learning more about how our world is engineered and how it can be better engineered. So we provide a lot of uh, education to current clients as well as you know free education through our podcasts um, and monthly education calls. And so uh, those are our two main arms, our education and Bitcoin mining with co-location. So co-locating your miners with us. We also are uh, promoting initiatives and starting initiatives in the Pacific Northwest to get legislation like what Dennis Porter's passed in a couple other states in the U.S. passed in our region so that we can protect the rights of Bitcoin holders and miners in our region, um, as well as, you know, contribute to this, this grid of the future that I believe exists hand in hand with Bitcoin mining. So we talked about Texas for a little while, how ERCOT is kind of leading the way and being very forward thinking and experimental with how they integrate flexible loads like Bitcoin mining. Our region uh, has not had such a need for this in the past, and it's really just now coming to the surface that, that we need to have these programs. So one of our main initiatives is integrating with utilities and making sure that demand response programs are proliferated throughout the Pacific Northwest and the Bitcoin miners are rewarded for those. Amazing. Really, really cool. Um, great what you're doing. Um, we come now closer to the end routine of the podcast. I have one question always before the end routine. Uh, and the question is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin, besides Bitcoin mining, besides the things uh, that we already talked about in the podcast? You know, uh, I have a really, I have a really profound desire to create more time for myself and more time for other people. Um, if you've ever read Gigi's post about Bitcoin is time, uh, Jack Mahler's also did a, a post on this or, or a talk on this at Bitcoin Atlantis. I'm really passionate about helping people build a life that is rich in time. In fact, I have a book. This is a great purchase. If you want to spend $20, it's called Buy Back Your Time. It's by Dan Martell. It's uh, geared toward business owners and entrepreneurs, but I think it applies to anybody. You know, we we get into Bitcoin partially because we're looking to create wealth, but also because of what wealth creates, which is more time for us to live a fulfilled life. And if I'm not teaching people about Bitcoin, which is one of my great passions, I am creating time for myself, or creating time for other people so they, they can enjoy their passions, one of which is music for me. But uh, that would be my my kind of superpower outside of this is lifestyle design and helping people become more in charge of their their own experience of life and not just living it by default. We all get to wake up and choose what our day looks like, what our week looks like, how we use our time, um, how far our impact goes. And I think that aside from stacking more Bitcoin, if you can figure out how to organize, prioritize and better use your time, you're going to have a much more happy and fulfilled life. So if I could leave anybody with something to spend some time learning, learn how to how to preserve and grow your time because we all have the same amount of it. I love that a lot. Uh, and Bitcoin is time is, I feel like time is the only thing that is actually way more valuable than than bitcoin is and it's i, I made a recent post and it, and it got some traction um i don't have a lot of bitcoin to have massive stack i want more time like that it should not be your goal to have as much bitcoin as possible then you're not not really different to all the fiat guys that just want to maximize fiat profits then you just want to maximize bitcoin profits there's a difference in that but it's not that much difference but if you really want to just increase your time on earth your quality time on earth also like mm -hmm. your time you you cannot do much increase but you can better the time that you spend here and, and use it not to work uh, like 80 percent of your life for something that you don't even want but maybe 
only work 10% for something that you don't want and uh, spend most of your time actually in, in, in good things. Even though I always say there are seasons in life and sometimes you have to go uh, through a little bit of mud to, to go to the beach. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting how to look at that and, and, and great, great. And thank you for, for that input. And it's, um, it's also, yeah. you know, I think most people, when I say getting more time as well, think like more time to go sit on the beach or do nothing, you know, that's great. Don't get me wrong. Doing nothing is a, a very valuable skill to train yourself to do. I'm also a fierce meditator. So I think that's, it's worthwhile to do nothing, but even more so than creating time is, is creating the best uses of that time for you. So many of us spend a lot of our time doing things that are, are far lower value than what we're able to contribute to the world. And I think if you get lost doing, let's call it the five or $10 an hour tasks that don't feed your soul, that don't feed your purpose on this earth, um, in favor or, you know, in, in place of doing the things that really light you up and the things that, that can actually contribute to the world around you. I think that that's a really, a really sad wasted use of life. Um, and so it would really just encourage people that if you are able to build a life that's, that's rich in time, that you do what is the highest value of that time with the energy that you have and make sure that you're contributing back to the world. Um, spend as much time on the beach as you want, but if you're anything like me, uh, you know, retirement is not a concept that I jive very well with. <laughs> I can get to that because, uh, I always argue I'm kind of retired because I do every day this podcast, I can do every day things in Bitcoin. And I really like that. Uh, there are small portions of me that also have to work, uh, do some bookkeeping and do some taxes associated with my business. But uh, most of my time I can actually spend on, on great things. And even though it's not always easy, it's like, it's a lot of work also. Um, but, uh, it's something that I really like and I'm really passionate about it. And that's my form of retirement. Like that's, that's like, I can do hundred percent of the time that I want things that I really am passionate about. And so that's, that's a better form of, of uh, retirement because I know um, we had some videos about, oh, how many Bitcoins do you need for, for retirement? And those videos do really great. So I know it's something on the mind of Bitcoiners or the people that go into Bitcoin, but it's, I think less about the, oh, I just want to sit on the beach. It's more about like, oh, I want to do every day what I want to do. So that, mm -hmm. that that's always like I think a, a, a big distinction uh, between those. I find that the people that have retirement on their minds don't get to do something that they love every day. And that instead of retiring, they, they should just find something that they truly enjoy doing with their time that, that contributes. And, you know, everybody's in a different situation. I can only speak for myself, but it, it takes a little bit of effort and, and the reward on the back end of, of doing the things that you are most suited to do and that you enjoy doing, it benefits everybody. It's not just you, it's everybody who loves you, everybody who's in your life uh, gets to have a better experience of you and a better experience of the life you create if you are doing what you are here on purpose to do. And retirement, you know, retirement is, is a funny concept, but if you can just retire to doing what you love, um, I think that's much more interesting than retiring to doing nothing. It's, uh, it's a very deep uh, insight. I love it a lot. Um, we have an intro team where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And your question from the previous guest is what's the best way of entering a Bitcoin conversation to explain Bitcoin to a normie? Hmm. I would, I would start by asking the question of what is your greatest financial pain? And that should tell you what someone's biggest issue that they can solve is, you know, anytime you're in a, in a sales process, it's less about talking about the thing you're selling and more about figuring out what that person's pain point is. So if I were trying to open a conversation with someone, you know, for me personally, I, I just hate working with banks. I hate all the red tape. I hate having to move money around and someone call me and ask if I'm if I'm really doing it, if it's fraud. And then after I say yes, you know, still not letting me move my money. So for me, it was a sovereignty thing. For someone else, they, they, they might really be, their top of mind conversation would be, 
well, I just, I don't have any savings anymore. Like my savings seems to evaporate. Um, so really when you're opening up the conversation, I think you need to drill into what the individual's main pain point with money is. And you're going to have to give them a minute because most people don't think that deeply about what their pain point with money is. It's one of those abstract concepts that, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't come up enough in everyday conversation unless you live in the Bitcoin world and you're very passionate about talking talking about money and and describing you know the different characteristics of different types of monies. It's not something that most people have thought about. And so before you launch into a heavily intellectual tirade about why one form of money is better than another, you should be figuring out what that person's unique pain point is and trying to drill in on if there is a specific part that relates to that individual's life that you think you can address by teaching them about Bitcoin. I love that way a lot. Um, perfect. And thank you for, for joining us today. Um, uh, but wait, uh, before I let you go, before I forget, where can people find you and where can people uh, ask you questions? So you can, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, our company handle is at Abundant Minds. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. It's going to be the same handle at Abundant Minds where you can find our podcast. Uh, you can go to AbundantMinds.com, book a call with a member of my team if you're looking at getting into Bitcoin mining. We do offer uh, free initial consults so you can see if it's even the right fit for you, if it's the best strategy for you. But we love talking about Bitcoin. We love talking about Bitcoin mining. And we're really here to impact the lives of, of not just the people who work with our company, but everybody in our region. Uh, I think that this is a story that's just beginning to be told about how Bitcoin mining is going to reshape our energy landscape. And really, we, ju we just need to get the message out to more people um, and to, to make sure that people are hearing us and that we can have the impact that we so desire to have. So appreciate you uh, having me on, Robin. It was a really fun, fun chat with you, fun getting to know you, and I uh, hope we get to do it again. Perfect. Then, yeah, thank you for doing it. Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening for being here today with us. I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.